Hey everybody, welcome to another Off the Shelf Board Game Review. This week we're going to be looking at Francis Drake, a game for 3-5 to five players, ages 14 up, average play times will be under 2 hours. There is a really nice expansion for the game that does add a 2-6 to six player addition to the game with a couple of extra rules, some extra difficulties, and some extra challenges. In Francis Drake, each player is a privateer in the service of the Queen of England trying to cause as much havoc and destruction across the Spanish main. The game is played over three rounds and each round is broken down into two phases. In the first phase of every single round, the players will be fighting for resources across Plymouth Harbor trying to get things such as supplies which will help them to go further into the Spanish main, they'll need crew which will help them to attack cities and attack forts, and they also need guns which help them to attack forts, and also start sinking some galleons in the Spanish fleet. Players will also be able to call upon the assistance of the Queen, which will help them get a more powerful ship, a galleon which is actually powerful enough to start attacking all these Spanish galleons, because your frigate is not powerful enough to do it, so you definitely need to upgrade your ship. You can also use the Admiral, which is going to give you intel and tell you exactly how powerful and how great the defenses of these ships truly are. You can also bribe the governors and try to find out exactly what kind of defenses are protecting all these forts so you can try to get as much loot and as much plunder and cause as much destruction as you can across the Spanish main. But here's the greatest challenge in trying to get all your supplies across Plymouth. All these resource spaces are very limited spaces. It's a first come first serve. Whoever gets there first is going to get the best supplies and matter of fact it's even possible for enough players to completely take all the supplies from a certain location. So you're not be, you need to be quick, you need to be fast, and you need to outsmart your opponents to get all the supplies. Because once all the supplies are gone, the players are going to have to race to get their ships out onto the water. Because the person who gets their ships out on the water first is going to get the best picks of all the things they need to attack and cause destruction. And also get the best rewards. And this is where the real heart of the race comes in. Because players are going to need to be racing to get trade routes. They need to be racing to get these forts attacked and they need to be racing to also attack these cities and also attack the ships of the Spanish main. And you notice that each one of these discs are numbered so each player is going to put their discs out in order hidden so they don't know exactly which order the other players are going out to and then all the discs are going to be revealed and whoever gets to each location first is the one who's going to get the best resources because they're going to have gold, they're going to have gems, and they're also going to have silver and first come first serve on all these wonderful bits of loot. On top of that, the Queen of England wants you doing as much destruction across the entire Spanish main as possible, so she wants you to be attacking cities, she wants you to be attacking forts, and she also wants you to be attacking galleons every single one of these rounds. If you're able to attack all three of these, you're going to get much more points than anybody who's only concentrating on one target only, who's going to get a heck of a lot less points, and again, this is a point game. Whoever gets the most points is going to win. In the end, Francis Drake is a game about bluffing, about where you're going to be going. It's going to be a race to see who can get the best supplies. It's going to be a race to see who can get out into the Spanish main and do the most conquests and win the game. Whoever will be the most efficient privateer in the service of the Queen of England is going to be the grand winner of Francis Drake. Before I show you exactly how to play Francis Drake, there's a quick thing I need to explain to you so it doesn't cause a lot of confusion and this can cause some really quick easy confusion if you don't understand this very simple thing. The simple thing about the game is it is packaged, at least the current version of the game, there's an English and a German version of the game in the exact same box and if you flip all the components over you're going to have the German components, flip everything back over you're going to have everything in English. Just to show you a perfect example, you have these crew cards, if you flip them over you're going to see that they're in German. It goes the same thing for the actual game board itself. If I were to flip over this entire game board, all the spaces and everything are going to be in German. So don't confuse yourself. And the way to tell the difference is everything that's in English is going to be a blue color. Everything that's in German is going to be this yellowish orange color. So don't make that mistake. It's the most important thing you need to understand. And it's also going to go to the point that you're actually going to have some extra components in the box. So you need to make sure you separate those components, throw them underneath the insert so you don't accidentally add those components back into the game. And it's going to go for all the guardians for each one of these forts. You're actually only going to have four of these tokens, even though the box comes with eight of them. You need to make sure that you have two of the zeros, one of the ones, and one of the twos. And there's an exact duplicate set of these. Make sure you remove the duplicate set. And it's also going to go for the galleon tokens for the protectors of the galleons. There's going to be a zero, a one cannon, and a double cannon. 
Make sure you go through the box, remove those extra components, stick them underneath the insert so you don't make the mistake of accidentally adding them into the game and causing extra difficulty or possibly making the game a little bit too easy by including the wrong components. Just go through, quickly separate everything out so you have all the correct components to play the game. The other thing to understand about Francis Drake the game is that the game is played over three rounds and every round is broken up into two phases. It's basically almost like playing two separate games. That's how separate they are except they're going to affect each other. And the first half of every single round is going to be the Plymouth phase where the players are going to go through Plymouth getting all the supplies they need for the second half of each round which is where they're going to go sailing across the Spanish main. Now every time you play this game, if you're playing with three or five players, there's a little bit of extra setup that's required to play the game. There's the four player tokens, and you can tell the four player tokens because they're blue on one side and then the back half is going to be in German or yellow. If you're playing with three or five players, you're going to have to take the same kind of tokens, but they're going to be light blue on the front for the three player side, and they're going to be dark blue on the back for the six player side. And additionally, if you're playing with the three player side, you're actually going to have to place these tokens out on the board to cover their four player counterparts to make sure that the Plymouth board is more of a restricted board, making all the resources more of a tighter commodity, so you're fighting for the resources much more, because if you were to put, flip these pieces over to their five player side, you're going to see that there's an excessive amount of these resources, and there's going to be no challenge for all the players who are fighting for these resources. So make sure you figure out however many players you are having, and you set up the Plymouth board for exactly however many players you have. Light blue for three players. If you're going to have five players, you're going to flip it over to the darker blue side, and if you have four players, you want to use the tokens that have the English on one side and the German on the back side. It's a really important thing you have to do. If you don't do that, you're going to have a lot of confusion. And the game's probably not going to be that challenging and probably not going to be that fun. Additionally, between every single round, these location tiles are going to be randomized. So Plymouth Harbor is going to be in a different order every time you play the game. And as you're playing the game and you're going through Plymouth Har Harbor, it's a one direction only. All the players are going to start at this part of Plymouth Harbor and they're going to work their way around and come all the way back out to the point where they're going to leave the harbor again. You can't actually backtrack on the Plymouth Harbor at all. So if you decide to bypass crew and move to go to the shipyard to upgrade your ship to a galleon, you can't get this crew location anymore. You have to keep going around until you get to this crew location, which you're going to see isn't quite as efficient as this crew location. So that's part of the challenge of the Plymouth Harbor part as the players are fighting for all these resources. But the reason why I bring this up is because you're going to lay all these tokens out, these location tiles out, when you're playing with three or five players on the very first round. You need to make sure you cover all the four player locations with the three or five player location tiles. And not only on top of that, you have to make sure you put them in the correct order because there are true crew location tiles, there are two gun location tiles, there's also two supply location tiles. So you want to make sure the one that's earlier on the track is the one that gives you the more of whatever supply it is. So this supply location has a 3, a 2, and a 1. This one has a 2, a 1, and a 1. So you have to make sure the one that gives the more supplies is going to be earlier on the track than the one that gives the later. Same thing for the crew. You have 2 crew, 1 crew, 1 crew. This one gives 2 and 1. So this one gives more resources. So on the first round, and the first round only, you have to make sure that this is the earlier one. If you're playing a five-player game, it's going to be the exact same thing. You flip it over, you're going to see the exact same thing. The one that gives the greater resources is going to be earlier in the track. So this one gives three, two, one, and one. This one gives two, two, one, and one. So when you're setting up the game for the very first round, this goes only for the three and for the five-player game. You need to make sure you put out the location tiles, put them out in the order of the printed board underneath them, and you got to make sure that you put the location tiles that have the greater resources early in the track, but if you're playing a four-player game, you completely ignore all these location tiles and you use the ones that are printed on the board. But again, that's only for the four-player game. For the three and for the five-player game, you're going to use the location tiles that cover up those locations to start the game. Now, the basic flow for Francis Drake is Francis Drake is a point game. Whoever gets the most points, the point track is on the outside of the board. Whoever gets the most points is going to win the game. Players on the first half of every single round are going to be using their player discs to visit locations in Plymouth Harbor and to get the resources that they're going to get from every one of these locations. Now it's kind of a race because the first person in each location is going to get the best resources, but it's also a race because the first person to make it all the way through Plymouth Harbor and leave the harbor is going to be the first person to set sail on the second half of each round. So again, it's a race because you want to make sure you're getting enough resources to at least do some damage to the Spanish main 
but you also want to make sure that you're not spending so much time in the Plymouth Harbor that other players are going to get out into the Spanish main faster with you with maybe a little bit less resources, but being first out here is always best because you're going to get the first option to get the rubies, you get the first option to get the gold, you're also going to get the first option to get the silver, which are worth additional victory points at the end of the game. So for an example, in this situation right here, since the blue player was the only player to decide to sail here and they decided to get a trade route, since the only person get to go there, they can either take the coffee trade route, then take the tobacco, or then take the indigo trade route, and they don't have any competition there. But if we came to this location right here, we see that the blue player and the green player both sailed here. They also happen to choose the number four disc. This is where sailing order comes into effect. The blue player, since they're earlier in the sailing order than the green player, they're going to get first dibs. And if you get one of every trade route, you're going to get more points than somebody who gets a whole bunch of the same trade routes. So it's going to be 26 victory points versus a measly two victory points because you want the biggest variety you can when it comes to trade routes. Don't want to jump ahead of myself, but that just shows you how important play order goes. So in this example, the blue player would get their pick on every one of these trade routes because they happen to be further in the travel order, and they also happen to visit all three of these locations. Now, if we came over to locations such as this city right here, we'd see that the orange player sailed here before the blue player, so the blue player can still attack this city Unfortunately, though, since the orange player gets attacked there first, he's going to get the gold from going there first, and that's going to go inside their treasure chest, giving them extra victory points at the end of the game. So it does behoove you to try to be first at a location to get the extra riches, because you can get the victory points, plus the riches, even though the second player is only going to get the victory points. Speed does matter in this game. Speed also matters in this game, because the first person to make it back to the harbor is possibly going to get some extra victory points, and they're also, if they're the first person to return to the harbor, they're also going to be first to visit Plymouth in the next round. And these are all going to be shuffled up and randomized. So if you may want to be the first person to go there, because, for example, the Golden Hind happens to be the first location, you probably want to try your best to make sure you're first to sail back. Because if you make it back and get the Golden Hind, next round you're going to have five ships to sail out, which means you get to visit five locations versus the four of all the other players. It's only one Golden Hind, which means only one player can use it every single round. It can give you a huge advantage over the other players, making it sometimes important to try to cut your journey short, sail back to be first, that way you're first on Plymouth Harbor for the next round. Players are going to continue to do this for a total of three rounds, and at the end of the third round, all the scores are going to be added up. Whoever has the highest score is going to be the grand winner of the game. Francis Drake does require a little bit of setup before the game, and also requires a little bit of setup between every single round. So if you want to speed your play up a little bit, I usually recommend that you assign every single player at least one task to help set everything up really quick. I usually give one person the task of setting up Plymouth Harbor, give one person the task of setting up all the gems, and give another person the task of making sure they shuffle up all the ships and their locations and everything like that. Along with adding all these trade route locations onto the board, it usually sets everything up much quicker and makes it go much quicker between each one of the rounds because like I said, usually can be pretty little time consuming to get everything all clean up between every single round and you'll see that when I show you the actual gameplay for the game. Now to set the game with Francis Drake you're going to have to randomize the player order. You can do that any kind of way. You can usually just take each one of these ships, throw them in a little bag and draw them out one at a time and do that as your player order or whatever method you have or you can use an app or whatever you'd like to do to decide player order. But once you've figured out player order you need to lay out every one of these location tiles if you're playing with a three or five player game. And you have to lay them out exactly the way I explained earlier with the larger amounts coming before the smaller amounts. And again, this is only for the three or five player game. If you're playing the four player game, you're going to use the actual locations that are pre-printed on the board for the first round only. And then once you set up all the location tiles, you need to make sure you put a gem at every one of the locations based on the color of the gem. Every one of the ship locations is going to get a red gem, which represents jewels. Every one of the Further into the Spanish main locations with the forts and the cities is going to get a gold gem and that's represented by a little gold circle on the board in case you ever forget and there's four of those locations. And the locations that are a little bit closer to the English Empire, not quite as far into the Spanish main, are going to get silver at each one of the locations. You have two cities that are going to get silver and you also get two forts that are also going to get silver. Each player is also going to place one of their cubes on the types of conquest log to make sure they're tracking, make sure they're trying to do as much of every one of these conquests per round. And the more of these conquests you do on every single round, the more victory points they're also going to give you. The round tracker is going to start over on the first voyage for the game. And then every single player is going to start with exactly four victory points on the track. Now the reason why each player starts with four victory points is it allows you to use your informer 
I'll explain that how that works when we get to that point, but that is basically the complete setup for the game. After you set up every one of these boards with the supplies, the extra jewels, the extra gold, the extra silver, the crew, the cannons, the trade routes, the extra trades, the informer, the admiral, and also the governor. Each player is also going to get a player board in their color. It also names everyone on the ship, so everybody has a different ship name that they're sailing on. Every player is also going to get one of these investor tokens, and these are one-time use tokens. So once you've used them, they're gone for the game. So you're going to get a little token to remind you that you can only use it one time for the entire game. And each player is also going to get one cube left over. They're going to use that for the sailing phase, and I'll show you how that works when we get to that. But let's go and start with the very first round. That's the very first thing you're going to do in every single game you play. You're going to start with the Plymouth section of the board. During the provisioning phase, which is the first half of every single round, the players are going to be fighting for resources across Plymouth Harbor that they're going to use across the Spanish Main. Now, all these resources are very limited, and not everybody's going to be able to get to do everything, so you need to make sure you're concentrating where you need to go to get the right resources at the right time, but ahead of all the other players who are also racing for those resources. And like I've already mentioned, you're also racing to be first out of Plymouth Harbor, so that way you're also the one who gets to sail first across the Spanish Main. Every single player is going to get 10 player discs in their exact color, and they're going to use these smaller player discs to decide which locations across, across Plymouth Harbor they're visiting in an effort to get these resources. And each player is going to place one of these player discs one at a time in player order. And remember, the important thing is every one of these locations has limited resources. And also remember, you cannot go backwards on this track. You're basically running out there trying to get these supplies in order and trying to race to get to the end of the dock. So for your first move, you decide to bypass the crew and decide to go to the shipyard because there's only two locations in the three-player game without using your investor token that allow you to upgrade your frigate to a galleon. And galleons are required to attack the Spanish galleons because if you don't upgrade, you can't even attack them during the, sh the shipping phase. So it is something you want to consider, but in a three-player game, there's only two of those locations. So again, you're racing for these locations because again, it's first come, first serve. So as I said, players are going to be placing their discs on each one of these locations, and when they place their discs on that location, they're going to instantly get whatever supply is given to them by that location. They're going to place those supplies on their board, and once they place their disc, it's up to the next player who's going to place their disc on whatever location they want. Now they can take a location that's already been taken by another player as long as there is an open slot, so Orange could move here and go ahead and get the one crew, which isn't a very efficient move, but it's something they can definitely do. And then when it comes to the green player turn, they can either take that final crew or they can bypass the other players, move over to the shipyard, which is an instantly upgrade their frigate to a galleon, which means now that they're so far in the game, they're the only player who's going to attack the Spanish galleons during the sailing phase unless one of these other two players upgrade. And remember, there's only one other location that allows the upgrade. That's the queen, unless they spend their investor to upgrade. And you only get to use your investor one time per game. Players are going to continue placing their discs on the board, getting whatever resources they happen to get from landing at that location and upgrading whatever may happen from going to those locations and getting those items at those locations. But again, remember, the most important thing to remember is that you cannot go backwards on the track. So now that blue has moved all the way out to the queen, they cannot use this supply location. They can't use this guns location. They have to keep moving forward and marching for forward. When their turn comes around, so after blue places their disc, orange is the next person in order, they can come over here and get the three supplies. They're going to place the supplies on the board. And then the green player gets to go and decide what they want to do. They can go ahead and take the two guns if they want, if that's their decision of what they want to do. And now the blue player can place their disc since they're back in the turn order, but they can't go backwards and get the guns, can't go backwards and get the supplies. The only thing they can do is decide to move on and get whatever that new location that they just decided to take, whatever that location gives them, and adds to their player board. And again, they're racing to move all the way across. You can either take a location or decide that you have all the supplies you need and decide to set sail, and you're now first player in the player order when the shipping part of the game round starts. Once all the players have moved through Plymouth Harbor and decided exactly in what order their shipping is going to go out, that's going to end the provisioning phase for the very round you're in, and then you're going to go ahead and start the shipping round after you take care of the governor, after you take care of the informer, and after you take care of the admiral, and fill up the protectors for these galleons, figure out which kind of guards are going to be guarding each one of these forts, and also use the informer to start examining one of these locations and give you an edge over the other players during the sailing round. 
Now, every one of these locations inside Plymouth Harbor, while they may randomize every single turn, you're always going to have access to the same locations every single round. So every single round, this crew location is always going to be there. This queen location is going to go there. It may be in a different spot in Plymouth, but it's always going to be available to every single player every single round as long as that location has not been taken. Now, just go over these locations and tell you exactly what they do in, in pretty much order, at least the way they're laid out right now. Crew is going to give you crew members, and crew members are used for two things across the board. Crew members can be used to attack your cities, and crew members can be used to attack your forts. Now, the amount of crew members you're going to need is either going to be printed on the board if it happens to be a city, or it's going to be a randomizer plus an additional number if it happens to be a fort. Now, these randomizers for the forts are going to be anywhere from 0 to 2, plus a number on top of them. That's how many crew members you're going to have to discard in an effort to attack that fort. So, for example, if this fort happened to be protected by the level two guardians and this is going to be revealed after you set sail on your shipping you're not going to know exactly how many guardians are protecting that location until you actually set sail there but there's two guardians there plus there's already two guardians at that location to attack that fort is going to require four crew members to take it out plus it's also going to take guns but i'll get into that in just a second whereas opposed to the city there's no additional randomizer added to the city so the city only takes one crew member to attack and you simply take the crew member discard it and you go ahead and get the reward if you're the first person there you're going to get the jewels the silver or the gold also and then you're going to score amount of victory points based on the number underneath that crown and you're going to move up on the victory point track and since you also attack one of those locations you're also going to mark the fact that you happen to attack one of those locations because if you attack all these locations you're going to get extra victory points if you only attack one of these locations on your voyage you're only going to get one victory point if you attack two of the three you're going to get four you attack all three, you're going to get 10 victory points at the end of that round. The next location we're going to have in Plymouth is going to be the shipyard. And I've already showed you what shipyard does. It allows you to upgrade your frigate into a galleon. And galleons are required to attack these Spanish galleons out there across the board. If you don't upgrade, you can't even visit these locations at all, which means you can't get the victory points, 4, 6, and 8, and the gems that happen to be attached to those locations. If you don't upgrade, you can't attack them, so you have to get that shipyard. And again, as I said earlier, there's not enough shipyards and queens for all the players to upgrade every single turn. So there is a race to get those locations. The next kind of location you're going to have is you're going to have a location is for guns. Now, guns are used for attacking forts along with crew members. Guns are also used for attacking ships. Now, every single one of these forts is going to have a certain amount of guns that are required to attack that location unless you have a special ability card. And I'll get to that when we get onto that on the board right here. But generally, you're going to need that many crew member and that many guns to go ahead and attack that fort. As opposed to ships, you're going to need that many guns to take out that ship on top of the amount of ships that you're going to have protecting that. Which again is going to be another randomizer anywhere from zero to two additional guns. And you're not going to know how many protectors are on that ship until you actually visit that location and flip over the token. You're going to add that to that to see how many guns you're going to need to take out that galleon. So in this example, this galleon would take five guns to totally destroy, to get the jewels, and to get the victory points. This token happened to be here. This galleon would take two guns to take out to get the jewels and also get the four victory points. And finally, this galleon right here to take out would take two guns to get the jewel to get the six victory points. And if you decided to sail over to this fort, it would take two plus two, four crew members, plus two guns, and you have to discard all those resources to attack that fort. That would give you six victory points, the jewels, and it will also allow you to move down on the track, showing that you attack that location this game round. The next location we have on the board are going to be the supplies. Now, supplies are going to allow you to sail further into the Spanish main. Now, it may be hard to see on the camera here, but this game board is broken down into four sections. You have section one, where the number one here is kind of a greenish color. Then you have this kind of purplish color here, which is section two. Then you have this orangish yellow color, which is section three. And then finally you have this reddish color, which is section four. To sail out in these locations, you need to have in your possession that many supplies. Now, a nice thing about supplies is you don't actually burn them to sail out to those locations. So if you manage to get four supply crates on your board, that means you can sail all the way across the board and even go back and forth as you want because you're not actually burning the supply crates. They just show how far you can sail out. If your ship only happens to have two supply crates, the furthest you can sail out is into this purple section. If you happen to only have one supply crate, the furthest you can sail is only into this green section, which means you only have access to these two trade routes right here. You only have access to the city, and you only have access to this fort. 
Or as opposed to somebody who has two supply crates, you have access to everything in the green, plus everything in the purple, which also adds in this trade route, this galleon, this city, and also this fort. Whereas the player who happened to have four supply crates can sail all the way out if they want to and go all the way out to this section. And since they're the only person with four supply crates and everybody else in this example would only have two or one supply crate, they can pretty much dominate area three and four without any competition because the other players can't even sail out that far, meaning that you have your pick to decide exactly where you want to go for and get the better results of the gold rewards and the higher point value locations versus the lower point value locations. They're going to be more highly contested between these two players. The next location we have on the board is going to be the Queen. And the Queen actually gives you a, quite a few rewards, making her very, very good to get a hold of if you happen to do it. First of all, the Queen is going to allow you to upgrade your frigate and upgrade to a galleon if you happen to visit that location. She's also going to give you one cannon to add to your ship. And on top of that, she's also going to give you one trade goods. Now, trade goods are used to establish trade routes. If you don't have any trade goods, you cannot establish trade routes, even if you visit these locations. Each trade route cube is going to allow you to acquire one trade route token, which can be worth anywhere from two all the way up to 26 victory points at the end of the game if you get a good enough variety of these trade routes. And basically, all you're going to do is when you get to that point is you're going to visit this location. You're going to change your trade good cube for one of these trade goods at that location. And remember, first come, first serve. So if you come here, this is the only space out of all three of these trade routes that can get indigo. So it may be worthwhile to go to this location first and get there first to get the indigo so you can work towards getting the most victory points. But again, every trade route cube is going to allow you to pick one of these at only one location. So if you want to get three trades on a single round, you're going to need three trade cubes, one for every one of these locations. Because one thing I didn't mention earlier, you can't sail to the same location twice. You have to go to a different location with every one of your sailing journeys. The next location on the board is going to be the tavern, which is going to give you an amount of crew based on the roll of a dice. If you roll a 1 to 2, you're actually going to get a ghost ship and not get any crew members. Now, the purpose of the ghost ship is going to be a bluffing mechanism. You can place the ghost ship on a location, and if you bluff right, people don't actually know that's your ghost ship that you placed there, and you can act like this is the location you really want to go to really badly. And you're going to outbluff your opponents who may throw lower tokens out there to make sure they beat you there. And then you're going to go ahead and reveal and show us your ghost ship and that you had ever had any intentions of selling that location at any time at all, making them waste their lower number discs. If you happen to roll a three or higher, you're going to get anywhere from two to three crew members to add your ship. And remember, crew members are used for cities and they're also used for attacking forts, so it may be good to go ahead and visit the tavern. The next location you can visit in Plymouth Harbor is going to be the Admiral. Now, the Admiral does one really, really cool thing. Normally when you're adding these extra cannon tokens to all these galleons that are out here protected, it's normally randomized so no player knows exactly which one of these tokens have been added to which one of these ships. So you don't know exactly how well protected each one of these ships are. Well, if you happen to bribe the Admiral, what it's going to do is you, as a player who actually bribed the Admiral, get to place these tokens out anywhere you like in any effort to make things more difficult for the other players. So for example, if you happen to be the player who happens to be able to sail all the way out here to Area 4, and the other players can only sail out to Area 2, you can go ahead and make it very difficult to capture that ship by adding the cannon to that ship. That gives you an extra 2 defense to that ship, and the other players don't quite know you did that. And then you put the weaker ships out here for you to go ahead and plunder and take over without any competition from the other players. So again, the Admiral does one very nice thing. It allows you to know exactly how well each one of these ships is protected. And on top of that, at the end of every single round, for every gold that was not taken by a player, it's going to give you one victory point. The next location on the board is going to be the trade goods. It's exactly like getting the queen over here, laying on that location. It's give you one trade good. Remember, each trade good can be used to trade for a trade route, which can be worth extra victory points at the end of the game. The next location we're going to have is the governor. Now, the governor is quite like the admiral, except the only difference between the governor and the admiral is the governor actually allows you to decide exactly where these guardians of every one of the forts are going to be placed, so you know exactly how well protected every one of these forts are. If nobody claims the governor, these are going to be randomized and placed out of every one of these four forts. And nobody's going to know exactly how many guardians are at every one of these forts, unless you happen to be the person who bribed the governor, and you're going to know exactly how many guardians are at each one of those locations. On top of that, the governor is very, very powerful in a two- and a three-player game, because whoever gets the governor gets to move up one place in the shipping order, meaning that if you got the governor in a three-player game, you're never going to go last. And if you're playing a two-player game with the expansion, if you get the governor, 
you can pretty much guarantee you are always going to go first after you leave Plymouth Harbor. The next location in Plymouth Harbor, after the crew members, we already know how those work, so we can go ahead and bypass those, is visiting Francis Drake himself. Now, Francis Drake is going to allow you to visit him, but he's going to force you to sit around and listen to his tall tales, which means he's going to tie up two of your cubes because you're going to have to spend two turns sitting at his location listening to his tall tales while he gives you a couple cannons and a couple crew members. So the very first time you place a cube on Francis Drake, you're going to get two crew members and two guns to add to your ship. And then when your turn comes back around again, you need to take one of your cubes, and you can't move on. You're stuck here with Francis Drake, who's going to tell you more stories. At the end of that story, you're going to get either one cannon or one crew. It's your choice. And then you're going to get to move on with the rest of your actions when your turn comes back around to filling up the rest of Plymouth Harbor. The next location on Plymouth Harbor is going to be the pinnace. Now the pinnace is what it is, is a longboat that's actually attached to your frigates or attached to your galleons. And if you happen to get that location and there's only one of those on the board in a three player game, what it's going to do is it's going to allow you to ignore the cannons that are protecting each one of these forts. So that means if you attack this fort right here, the only thing you have to give up is four crew members. You can completely ignore the two cannons. If you attack this fort right here and it happens to be protected by this token right here, you only have to discard one crew member. You can completely ignore the cannon, take the silver, and earn three victory points. And thematically, the reason why this works is because what a pinnace is, is it's a long ship or a long boat attached to your ship, and you don't have to sail your galleons within range of the cannons of these forts. You're basically going to come in around behind your opponent, launch your long boat, send your crew onto the ground, ignoring the cannons, and you're going to attack the fort and take the riches. So it's a really nice little thing, but again, there's only one of those in a three-player game, making them very hotly contested. One point to make, though, the pinnace only works versus forts. It does not work versus galleons at all, so don't think you can get that and start sneaking and attacking ships also. All it does is it allows you to ignore the cannons that are protecting all four of the forts on the board. The next location is going to be the Informer. I'm actually going to go ahead and bypass the Informer, except to tell you that when you visit him, he does give you one trade good. You already know how the trade goods work, so I don't need to repeat myself there. But he's going to influence exactly how things work once you set out sailing. So when we get to that point of the explanation, I'll show you exactly how the Informer works. So let's go ahead and bypass him now. We'll go to the Golden Hind. And what the Golden Hind does is the first person to go there is going to end up getting a fifth disc, which is going to allow them to visit five locations versus all the other players who can only visit four locations. And the Golden Hind is actually a zero disc, and what that means is the discs are going to resolve in order of numeric value from lowest to highest. All the ones are going to go, the twos are going to go all the way up to the fours. Well, the Golden Pinnace, or I'm sorry, the Golden Hind is actually a zero, so whoever owns the Golden Hind gets to resolve their location on the board no matter where it is before anybody else does, giving them not only a fifth disc, it also allows them to go before any of the players, giving them one heck of a great advantage. And then finally, we come to the investor location, which is the only location that does not have a token or a location tile to place on top of it. It's always going to be the second to last location in Plymouth Harbor, and it's never going to shuffle, never going to randomize. It's always the last location. Now, there's two things to remember about the investor location. One, to visit the location, obviously, you have to place your disc there. But the second thing is you need to burn your investor tile. Each player is going to start the game with one investor tile only. And once you burn it, it's removed from the game. You cannot use this location anymore for the rest of the game. And when you visit the investor, he's going to take some points away from you. He's going to take four victory points away from you immediately. And it doesn't matter where you're on the track, you're going to lose those four victory points. That's why at the beginning of the game, every player starts with four victory points. So you can technically use the investor the very first round of the game. Once you burn those four victory points, and once you discard your investor tile, you get a choice. You can either get one crew member, and two guns, or you can get one gun and two crew members from the investor. Or your final option is you can use him to upgrade your frigate to a galleon, but again, this can only be done once per game because it costs you this tile to use that location. The final location in Plymouth Harbor is gonna be the dock side. You're gonna see there's a circle location, one for every player color in the game. If you decide to use that, you're simply gonna move there and take the color location for yourself and then once you're at the dock side, you get to take one resource and one resource only. You can take one supply crate. Remember, supplies are going to allow you to sail further into the Spanish main. And don't be caught short. If you end up forgetting and get zero supplies, you don't get to sail at all. So don't make sure you leave Plymouth Harbor without any supplies at all. Otherwise, you're going to have a very boring round coming up for your turn. The other thing you can do is you can get one cannon 
or you can get one crew member to add to your board. Now remember, you don't get all of these. You either get one or one or one. And then finally, that's all the Plymouth. Once you've gone through the entire board, the next thing you do is put your ship out in the Plymouth Harbor, and now we're ready to start the sailing phase of the round. Now the players are done with Plymouth Harbor, and the next thing we need to do is we need to set sail, or at least get preparations ready to start sailing across the Spanish Main. The very first thing we need to do is, if a player happens to have taken the Admiral token, what they're going to do is they're going to take the tokens for all the extra ships that are protecting the galleons. They get to look at them, and they get to place them face down at any one of the three locations for the galleons. And now remember, this means that Admiral player is going to have a little bit of knowledge over the other players because they're going to know exactly how many cannons are protecting each one of the locations. Now, if no player was ever able to take the Admiral, or if all players bypassed the Admiral and didn't take the space, these tokens are actually going to be shuffled and randomized and placed face down in every one of these galleon locations. And that means that none of the players are going to know exactly which kind of guardians are protecting every one of these galleons, and nobody's going to know exactly how many cannons are protecting these and how many cannons it's going to take to take out these Spanish ships. So again, the player who got the Admiral gets the pick. If nobody picked the Admiral, it's going to be completely random. After that's done, the player who picked the Governor gets to do the exact same thing. They get to look at the Spanish guards who are protecting every one of these forts, and they get to place these tokens down every one of the forts, and they're going to know exactly how many guardians are protecting every one of these forts. Just like the Admiral, though, if nobody picked the Governor, that means nobody has the forehand knowledge of exactly which kind of protectors are protecting every one of these forts. And that means that they're going to be randomly shuffled and placed face down, so again, no player knows exactly which kind of guardians are protecting every one of these. Now these tokens are always going to be placed face down, whether it's placed there intentionally by a player or whether they're random, because players are going to be setting sail and not exactly knowing which kind of protections are going to be at each one of these locations. Of course, unless you bribe the Admiral or bribe the Governor, and those players alone are going to have that extra special knowledge. At this point, the player playing the Governor gets to be a little bit meaner to all the other players because they get to move up one space in the shipping order because the Governor has given them a little bit of a hand, a little bit of extra knowledge to help them in all their sailing duties. So in this example, it looks like the green player happens to be the player who took over the Governor location. So they're going to go from second place to first place, bumping the first player back into second place, changing the shipping order for this game. And I know I'm not showing you the expansion with this video, but that does mean the Governor is extremely powerful in a two-player game because if you take the Governor, that means you pretty much have guaranteed you're going to be the first person sailing across the Spanish Main. No matter how much time you take in Plymouth Harbor, you're going to be the first player because you're going to move from number two to number one as the Governor. After that's done, each player is going to count up exactly how many barrels they have, and that's going to tell them just exactly how far they can sail across the Spanish Main. If you happen to only buy one supply barrel, you can only move up to section number one. If you happen to buy two supply barrels, it does mean you can move all the way up to section two and use section one also. And if you happen to be the player who got three, or in this case, happen to get four supply barrels, that means you can sail all the way across the entire Spanish main, meaning every location is open to you when we start the sailing part of the phase. After that's done, every single player is going to pick up their player disc and they're going to place their player disc on the board face down one at a time and in order of the sailing order. So green is going to place one of their sailing discs down on the board and then the orange player is going to pick up one of their sailing discs and they're going to place it down on the board at any single location they wish to go to and then finally the blue player is going to do the same thing deciding which kind of locations they want to go to. Now remember they need to respect the distances they can sail across the Spanish main. So orange and green can sail into area one because they have at least one supply barrel the blue pair can sail all the way into area two because they have at least two supply barrels. But unfortunately, our green player who happens to only have one supply barrel is pretty limited as far as they can sail. They can only sail into area number one, which means since that they did get the golden hind, it's kind of a waste for them because they only have four areas total they can sail into. So they kind of hamstrung themselves with their decisions, but that just shows you how important it is to make the right decisions as you're playing the game. So as I said, the players are going to continue placing discs in every one of the locations. Remember, you can't visit the same location twice, but you're more than welcome to go to any location you can legally reach across the board as long as you have enough supplies and you're going to continue placing these discs one at a time until you happen to have all the discs placed on the board. After all the players have placed all their sailing discs down on the board and they're all going to be face down, so no player knows exactly which player from their opponents is selling to which location first. Now remember, it is still a race of a game. First come to each location and get the extra special rewards such as the riches, the jewels, the gold, and the silver. 
So you definitely want to be first to each location. But even if you're not first to each location and you don't get the jewels or the gold or the silver, you're still going to at least get the victory points for attacking that location if you decide to keep your attack. Because even though you decide to sail to a location, you're not required to act, interact with that location. If you sail to a location and decide it's just not worth it to you, you'd be better off sailing back to a planet to make sure you're the first player for the next round, you're more than welcome to make that decision. After all the players have placed their ship disc, we need to figure out who the informer player is, if there is an informer player, and then they're going to go ahead and use their informer to do one of two things. They can either look at a location where they currently have a mission disc, and in this example, the green player is the informer, and they and they alone can look at all the ships at location and figure out exactly which order all the ships are going to go ahead and resolve. Now in this example, the green player knows that they're going to resolve this location first, the orange player is going to resolve it second, and then the third player is not going to get anything at all unless one of these two players decide not to interact with that location. Because you notice on the board, every single location except this very singular location where you interact with trade routes only can handle up to two people interacting with them. So again, back to like I said earlier, it is first come, first serve. So in this example, the green player would be able to interact first, the second player would be able to interact second, and then the third player would be left with nothing at all but they're still forced to sail that location. They can't move their disc, because remember, this is the informer player, and only the informer player knows exactly the location of all these ships and what order they're going to be going on, and they have that knowledge alone as the informer player. So their option is to look at the discs, and after they've looked at the discs, they can look at any two discs of theirs on the board, and it doesn't even have to be this disc itself, but they can look at any other two discs they currently have on the board, and rotate their positions so they go to sailing in different sailing orders. It's not mandatory, but something you can do after you look at all the discs at that location. After you look at the discs, you replace them on the board, still face down, so you don't give away knowledge to any of the other players. The other thing you can do as the informer is instead of looking at the shipping order, you can look and see exactly what happens to be guarding this location. And you can do this privately, flip over the disc, and look exactly what kind of guardians are at the location, the only requirement is you have to look at a location that you are currently sailing to. And after you look at that total, you can decide that if you want to continue sailing to that location or if you think that that's too powerful of a location and you don't have the resources to take it out, you can take your sailing disc and sail to any other location that's fully legal for you to sail to anywhere on the board as long as you have enough supplies to make it to that destination. Of course, you do have to mind the normal rule for the game that no player can sail to the same location twice in the same round. So if you use your informer to sail away, I couldn't sail over here to make sure I get that location twice because that's never a legal move. You can never sail your ship to the same location twice on the same round. After the players are done taking care of the informer, all the players are going to reveal their ship location disc and we're going to figure out exactly which sailing order every single player is going to sail to and we're going to figure out if there's any players who are left out in the cold because they're not going to sail quick enough to a location to get the rewards from that specific location. And you're simply going to place the ships in order of who's going to go there first. And remember, it's a numerical order, and the Golden Hind is always considered the zero ship, so he gets to resolve first. So it would be a zero, it would be a two, and then the three is not going to get to do anything unless one of these two players decide not to interact with that location, which is probably not going to happen in this location, but there's still that very slim chance that could happen. Now, if there's ever a tie at a certain location, the ties are going to resolve in order of sailing order, so since green sailed before blue, green is going to get first choice at location, which means they get to get the indigo. And you'll notice that on all the trade routes, this is the only trade route where it's possible to get the indigo. At the end of the game, you want one of every single trade route to get the most victory points at the end of the game. So we simply reveal all the locations. If any player has a golden hind, they're going to go ahead and resolve their location first before any other player resolves at all. Now, if a player is resolving a location that happens to have a guardian, as soon as they sail that location, they're going to go ahead and reveal that guardian. So now all the players get to see exactly what is guarding that location. Now, that knowledge is not going to be happening beforehand, of course, unless the informer uses one of their special powers. But the location guardian is not going to be resolved until somebody actually sails that location and flips the disc over. Once we do that, the player at that location gets to decide if they want to interact with that location or if they want to decide it's not worth the amount of resources it's going to cost. So if the green player, since we're handling the golden hind first before any other player gets to resolve their actions, they're going to see that to attack this fort, it's going to take two crew members because there's no extra guardians, and it's going to take two cannons. So if they want to attack it, they need to discard two cannons to go ahead and attack it, and then they also need to discard 
two crew members to go ahead and attack it. Now if they do decide that they're going to go ahead and take those resource losses to go ahead and attack this location, they're going to get the amount of victory points for that location, going gaining six victory points, bringing them from six or from four all the way up to ten. They have successfully attacked a fort, so they're going to track that on their mission log for this round. And then since they're the very first player to interact with this location, they're going to get the treasure from this location, which is going to go inside their treasure chest. And at the end of the game, all these treasures are going to give everybody extra victory points, which means nobody knows exactly who is winning the game until the very end of the game when all the players resolve all the jewels, all the gold, and all the silver in their treasure chest and add those victory points to their scores at the end of the game. And if you forget, every silver is worth three victory points, every gold is worth four, and every jewel is worth five victory points at the end of the game. After the player of the Golden Hind reserves their location, all the players are going to mark their locations with their ghost ships so they know exactly where they were in player order when we need to resolve any ties in case that happens in any locations, such as this location right here. And also at this point, if any player actually had one of the ghost ships out on the board, it would be pulled back at this point so you can have your player order so we know exactly which order all the players are going to resolve. Now once this is done, now that we've resolved the Golden Hind, all their players are going to move to their number one mission disc to show the very first location that they're sailing to, and they're going to go ahead and resolve their locations in order just like that. So green's going to resolve, orange is going to resolve, blue's going to resolve, and we're going to do that for all the ones. Then all the players are going to sail over to their twos, and we're going to resolve them in player order again. Players are going to resolve their threes and resolve their fours. And of course, at any time after they resolve a location, if they decide to, they have the option of saying, I'm done with my sailing. I want to return to Plymouth Harbor to make sure that I'm going to go earlier in the next round. There's one advantage to returning home early. If you return home early and you've managed to attack at least one galleon, attack at least one city, or attack at least one fort, you're going to get some bonus victory points. First person back gets two. Second person back gets one. But if all you did was interact with trade routes and you didn't attack at all, you do not get those bonus victory points, but you do block the other players from getting those free victory points. So you do have to make sure you do at least one extra attack or one attack at all to get those free victory points at the end of the round. And at every single location, like I've emphasized many, many times, it is a race. First come, first serve, so the first person each trade route gets to decide exactly which trade good they want to take from each location. And then the player left over gets to decide from the remainders whichever trade route location they want to take. So if Green decided to go here, he would definitely take the Indigo since it's one of the rare resources out of any of the trade routes. Then Blue, once they resolve all the twos, we had a choice between the coffee and the tobacco. And they're simply going to add that to their board, and that way at the end of the game, if they happen to get all four of the trade routes, so you can get those extra victory points at the end of the game. If you only get one trade route, it's two victory points. If you get two different trade routes, it's eight. Three different trade routes, it's 16. If you get all four different, it is 26 victory points. Now, you can get the same trade route twice, but it's not going to give you that many points. If you end up getting two coffee trade routes, each one is only going to give you two for a total of four victory points at the end of the game. So you definitely want to make sure you get a wide variety of trade routes for the most victory points at the end. Remember though about trade routes, it does cost you a trade cube to use that trade route. So if you do decide to use that trade route, you are required to discard one of your trade cubes and then you can take that trade route and add it to your board. And all the trade routes are going to be scored at the end of the game. So you just make sure you put them on your board and leave them off to the side for the ending score at the very end of the game. After all players have sailed all four of their routes and decided in what order they're going to return to Plymouth Harbor for the next round, the players are going to get bonus victory points depending on how many missions types they decide to complete. So if the orange player, I'm sorry, if the blue player happened to have the galleon and they happen to attack a galleon, they happen to attack a fort, and they actually happen to attack a city, they're going to get 10 bonus victory points at the end of this round. If a player such as the green player only managed to do one of the three things, they're going to get one bonus victory point. And if one player decided to do none of those things, they're going to get zero extra bonus points at the end of the round. After that, all the players are going to sail all the way back to Plymouth Harbor. We're going to move up to the second round. All of these tiles are going to be shuffled up and they're going to be randomized. And then they'll be placed out back on the board in a random order, making sure that the order of all these locations is going to be different every single time. Players are going to go through Plymouth Harbor for the second round, figure out play order. We're going to sail and repeat the entire process for a second round. And then finally for a third round, at the end of the game, we're going to add up all the victory points, adding in our trade routes, adding in any bonus victory points we have for silver, gold, and jewels. And whoever has the most victory points at the end is going to be the winner.
The only thing you need to make sure you do when you're playing Francis Drake in between every single round is you need to make sure that every one of these jewel locations are refilled between rounds. Every one of these gold locations are refilled between rounds. Every one of these silver locations are refilled between rounds because players are going to get be able to get there and get those resources every single round and they refill every single round making sure it's always a race every single round to be the first at those locations get those bonus gems so make sure you always refill those make sure that every single round you're shuffling these ships up so we don't know exactly which ship is going to be at which location at all and it's going to move around from the four and the six and the eight victory points forcing players to change their strategies and figure out exactly how far they're going to sail every single round and also these tokens right here are also going to be withdrawn and they're either going to be shuffled and randomly placed on the board or a player happened to pick the Admiral. Again, they get to decide exactly which locations they go to. It's going to be the same thing for the guards of every single one of these forts, randomizing the board in that aspect too. And that guarantees that the game board is going to be randomized just a little bit every single round, changing up all the strategies. And also remember, every single round you're required to go through and do all of these things every single round. And if you don't, you're not going to get those bonus victory points. So every single round, if you want to get the most victory points, you need to make sure you do all three of these actions. And again, that shows just how contested all these locations in Plymouth Harbor will be because you're going to need to make sure you go to all of them to make sure you're able to go get the extra bonuses for doing all three types of conquests. Trade routes also get refilled every single round, so make sure you refill those. If players did happen to take some of those trade routes, they are going to be filled back up so they're available for the future players on the future rounds. So players also can go for all the trade routes and just make sure you refresh everything every single round. I hope I've explained Francis Drake well to you enough so you understand how to play the game. I'm going to go ahead and clean everything up, set it up, and shoot my second video where I'll show you exactly what Francis Drake looks like with a three-player game. But before I do that, I forgot about one very important thing, and i sorry I forgot this. This is actually very, very important. It makes a big difference about the game. Everything resets in between rounds, including your ships, so your galleons may sail into port at the end of the round, but they're going to refresh and turn back into frigates at the end of every single round. And any crew members, any trade supplies, and any cannons you did not use are going to be removed from your board, meaning you're basically going to start off from scratch every single round with zero backup resources, zero backup crew, zero backup anything. The only thing you're going to keep between rounds are any successful trade routes you happen to create on your turn, and also any gems, jewels, or gold, or silver that you happen to have in your treasure chest. Everything else in the game resets. Now on to the gameplay video.